bunch of loony spacemen who'd been on a spaceship for, you know, for a thousand years and had gone completely wacko. There's some very respectable rock and rollers out there that cite Hawkman that has a major influence in them. John Lydon from the Sex Pistols, he said there would have been no Sex Pistols if it wasn't for Brainstorm. All the punk bands, they were looking to Hawkman as a role model, really. It was like Star Trek with long hair and drugs, you know. I mostly drummed in the news. Well, I got so hot and sweaty, I was just like a racehorse when I finished. I was literally descending into hell. Really. I mean, you imagine this six foot two bird with tits the size. I mean, if she turned around too fast, she'd kill you. I mean, we weren't the fucking Pink Floyd, man. We weren't, you know, cute. <laughs> we were like a fucking black nightmare. We used to lock the doors so people couldn't get out. <laughs> Too wild and ugly for the rock and roll mainstream, Hawkwind forged the original sound of the Westway from the back of a flatbed truck, and over the next four decades led the British underground from the squats of Ladbrook Grove to the solstice at Stonehenge and beyond into the new dawn of rave and techno. Good it's old right, days, mate. eh? <coughs> it's all right, mate. Well, it doesn't change round here very much, does it? It wasn't in Hawkins. Oh, was he the singer? Yeah. Oh, right. This is where Dave Brothers is to go busking. That's right. It's, yeah, I do, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. He was doing the The only original member of Hawkwind in the band today is founder Dave Brock, seen here on the left in 1968. Brock's musical career began on the streets of Ladbrook Grove as a busker. His co-founder members Mick Slattery and Nick Turner have come back to retrace their steps. But he didn't do it as well as that. No. <laughs> Can we do that? What about the copyright? Unfortunately, Dave Brock has declined to appear in this film due to the participation of Nick Turner. In the, corporate mask, good morning, ah. the band grew from a core of Dave Brock and Mick Slattery. Nick Turner came on board with a van and a saxophone, and they soon recruited Turner's friend Dick Mick on electronics, bassist John Harrison, and a 17 year old drummer. Terry Ollis. We got the um, Royal College of Art, a lecture hall in there, where we, always, we, had, we had it for the whole summer break, so we could leave all the gear set up on the stage there. And they used to go and drop acid and go and play up there. With strobe lights. <laughs> So they just go out there and play for hours and hours, and then they went out and played gigs. We did a gig at the All Saints Hall, which was in Notting Hill Gate, and that was the first gig that the band did. We went as Group X, and it, the gig was actually being run by some people from an agency called Clearwater. Doug Smith was one of the guys involved with the management company. And in walked this bunch of reprobates, is all I can call them, because they, they certainly weren't like anybody else. They definitely stood out as travellers, and they said, Give us a go. And we just said, how? You got any equipment? It's too late. Can you set up? The agreement was they would use high tides equipment. Well, I first saw them on their very first gig, All Saints Hall, with High Tide. That's the band I was playing with at the time. They were one of the first bands to use a strobe or to, or to use any kind of lighting effects, really, in those days. That was a bit tripping that night. And that particular night, John Peel would come. And he walked out and he sort of grabbed me by the arm and said, Get them. They sound as if they're going to do something. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. And that's really where Hawking came together, you know. But we never really got the name for some time later, really. I think the name of Hawking came from a mixture of um, partly to do with Michael Moorcock's influence. We all read his books. Part of it was also a habit of um, 
farting and spitting. Nick was always scraping his throat and hawking and doing these really elongated musical farts. No sooner had Hawkwind signed a record deal than they lost their first member, Mick Slattery, who went to live in a gypsy caravan in Ireland. In the band's tug of war between fellowship and sole ownership, he was the first of almost 50 musicians to pass through Hawkwind over the last 37 years. Slattery was replaced by Hugh Lloyd Langton, and soon afterwards, the band went into the studio to record their first single. Because there was a cult following that had built up by that point, they sold records at Southern Bank. Oh, this, this looks interesting. Maybe we'll make an album. For the first album, I think, had this captured the spirit of the band the most. For at the time, just played live in the studio, pretty much the first album. The music scene of the time was heavily influenced by what was going on in the hippie movement in America. But instead of the flower power of San Francisco, Hawkwind grew out of the urban sounds of Ladbrook Grove. I think the Ladbrook Grove scene and, and around that area was rather like Greenwich Village, I suppose. There was a lot of very creative people there. It was quite exciting, really. At one party, I remember introducing Arthur Clarke to William Burroughs, which everybody thought would be impossible. You know, there was Clarke, the scientific chap, and Burroughs, the, the beat. And they got on like a house on fire. They would not, you know, they just kind of stayed together the whole, the whole evening talking. I've never been in an environment, certainly in England or Great Britain even, where music so defined the environment and uh, very different and eclectic kinds of music. It was really great, you know, it was really fantastic. Drugs were very important, especially around Portobello. There was always lots of good marijuana, good hashish. Hash cookery, man, 16 traditional recipes, two shillings. Lots of great acid as well. But of course there was speed and a few other dodgy things that didn't do so well for people. And it was that period, it was, you know, it was, it was at the crossroads between the 60s and the 70s. The 70s hadn't really defined themselves yet, it was still early days. And in the middle of this were people like Hawkwind, living on soulful and spiritual endeavour, basically. And I think that's what they wanted to do with their music. It was in Ladbrook Grove that the band first teamed up with Michael Moorcock, leading light of a new wave of science fiction writers. 